I mentioned before I was trying a number of times to um, figure out how to avoid being in this quandary of multiple, multiple mistakes, uh, you know, errors in proportion and errors in every possible kind of way, very early on in a drawing and in a painting as well. And um, so I sat down and began reviewing all the sort of the aphorisms that I had, wanting to see if there was something I was doing that had to do with the timing of things. You know, is there something in all these aphorisms, you know, like, um, like um, uh, be all over the place at once in the start, or, um, or uh, uh, well, <laughs> for some reason they're escaping me right now. The one we're talking about today came to my mind, and, uh, but it was, it was paint as if you were coming out of a fog. And so I've mentioned that, and someone else has picked up on it who's coming from a very different background. And, uh, but I began immediately, and I've shown the, uh, the uh, uh, écorché figure. I may show that again just right here, but uh, the écorché figure done with the charcoal uh, was where I began to break it out. I said, okay, let's, let's put down the top and bottom, you know, and, uh, and let's see how many errors I already have. But before that, what I'd done is I said, let's paint as if I was coming out of a fog. It was the only thing I could think of that actually said, first you do this and then you do that, rather, you know. Paint as if you're coming out of a fog, coming, coming out, you know. Uh, so going from here to there, and I thought, well, what is that? What is that fog thing? And I, believe me, I was in a fog about it. So, I, so as I sat there, uh, you know, um, puzzling and puzzling over it, I started doing things with my eyes, which is kind of a key thing, because I thought, well, let's create a fog. And so I began to blur down my eyes quite a lot and looking at whatever I'm looking at. You could do it looking at me in this screen right now. And I saw very quickly that, um, that there was a whole lot of material that would disappear if you fogged your eyes down. And of course, you squint down even more and you see even fewer actual uh, players, shall we say. There, there are fewer silhouettes, there are fewer effects. And I blurred my eye and blurred my eye and finally got down to this point where I could see three or four or five significant effects. And it was a startling experience because I said, huh, so they mean then you could paint the strong guys first. And I said to myself, like the headlights of a car coming out of a fog before you can see the bumper, before, before, hopefully before you can see the grill, before you can see the, the dashboard, you're gonna see headlights. And then you'll see a little bit more and a little bit more and it'll gradually emerge. And, I, and, and suddenly this whole idea of visual order popped into my head. And what I'm going to describe to you today is, what I'm going to try to show you today is the beginning of that. And if I can't succeed, I'm going to give this a good shot, my best shot. And if I can't succeed, I'll do it again another, in another, with another stabbing in a different direction perhaps. But um, what are the, one of the other things that it clarified to me though was that, that you have to paint... I'm sorry, it really refreshed the idea in my mind of what in the world the arabesque was, because we were taught about the arabesque. And if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, it says the figure created by the leading lines of a, composi of a composition. Now, that's an abstraction. That's you know, a bunch of leading lines of a composition suggest that we're already in this discussion about the visual order that introduces itself somewhere around the 1600s. And very much probably related to Velasquez, but this whole idea of visual order, which is different now from the storytelling order and all those other things, you know, the, the grouping of figures and all those things in their own in their own right. So, um, and then of course it occurred to me that all over the place at once in the start was much more likely to be, or you're going to need to do it because you're not going to be doing the head and the shoulders and then something else. You're going to be doing this part up here that reads well, and this part over here, and that part over there, and you're going to situate those things, creating the figure, that leading, that figure created by those leading spots. Now, um, Louise, Louise specifically said, is it possible for you to discuss painting starts from the fog in more depth and perhaps show some examples in one of your upcoming YouTube discussions? I'm assuming that preliminary compositional drawings have been made on complex subjects first. That is interior scenes or complex still life setups. Now online you can find those by me. You can find one in which there is some level of 
of preliminary drawing, and you can find one in which there isn't any. Uh, and the more complex one is one in which there isn't any. And I don't use those lines anymore because I found that there's so much time wasted. You're drawing things you don't even, you can't see with your eyes, and you would never uh, waste huge amounts of energy on, on things you don't see well, right? So there's so many little philosophical or, or wisdoms, if you want to call it that, in taking this other approach. Now, we do know, I'm going to use Vermeer as an example, because we do know that Vermeer painted rather as if he had done a drawing and filled it in on some level. Uh, the little painter in the studio suggests something that might have been in that category, though there's still certainly plenty of room to doubt that that's exactly what he, you know, what he shows there is exactly what he did in his, um, in his lay-ins. But the backgrounds, the, there are some pictures in the background of some of his pictures that actually show a rather serious attention to uh, the, the, the flat pattern, the, the complete flat pattern of different figures. Although it really is based, even in those things, it's based more on the light and, the, and mass than it is on um, outlines of objects, uh, which is more apparent in other people's work. So let me just give this a try. I'm going to put up, I'm going to hold up in my hands a Vermeer and I'm going to put the, on the screen an image of the same Vermeer. And I'm going to show you, this is a demonstration that I did. And it's a start. Uh, so it's a lay-in. The way I think about the visual order, uh, and I, the way I think about coming out of the fog, and I think it can give, if you ha anyone has eyes to hear, this is the great secret that of, the, um, of this way of working. This is really fundamental. So. I don't know. I think I can get that little. There's enough room for me, this picture, and a Vermeer maybe over to the side there. But if you can see what I've aimed at in this picture, you'll see that this area is significantly well worked on. You'll see that certain things up here are well worked on, way up in this area here, uh, sit, beginning to be situated. By the way, I've scattered as an impressionist, I've scattered notes of color around, paying very special attention to their values. So that's very fundamental to what we're doing. But uh, what, what you're seeing, though, is that I've put a bunch of work into points with effects, looking for, and then eventually winding up with certain things up here, for example, or down here. You're looking for the places where, that emerge first. So visual order, the concept visual order. So if you look at the full painting and squint your eye at it, Hopefully you'll come to a similar conclusion, or at least you'll get an idea what I'm talking about when I do it. Sometimes these uh, lay-ins, um, yeah, you can see plenty of things, and you can see that I've been fairly articulate in a number of those places. Some of these spots don't mean anything. This is all, you can see in the picture, it's all gone, you know, nothing much there. And you can see that the effort is not brought to stuff and things, it's brought to strong effects. And so there's this set of players that make the arabesque, however you want to think of it, however you want to name it. And uh, so that's the first one. Uh, and let me just go quickly to another one. That was, uh, because I think this shows you how, how um, the thinking works. But I did a copy for a client of, um, of this painting of the, uh, let's see if I can get this to a place where you can see the whole thing, of this painting of, that you'll recognize, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, of a, um, of a, um, the, um, Isabella in the Pot of Basil, that macabre Boccaccio story. And um, what you're seeing here actually is a lay-in that's done that same way, perhaps pushed a little further. Obviously, the canvas is covered in this case. But everywhere you look, you're going to see the prominence, the strong players doing all the work of setting this whole painting up, certain aspects of this thing. So even in an area like this, you can see that there, there's a visual order leadership that you wouldn't grasp without blurring your eyes you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't look at it and say what should i what must i draw there and get right and but you can see that there are places in here where there's articulation very strong things very significant things high reading things with points but anyway high reading things so if you look at if you look at this uh, uh, if you looked at a model sitting in this setting with your eyes wide open and not blurring down, you wouldn't know what to paint for a second or a third. You'd just paint the figure, the dress, and all that sort of thing, and you wind up with a, a form of realism uh, that has no that, that 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 what shall we say in which which has not incorporated visual order from the start. And so that's really what's happening in this um, in this way of working: the visual order, not just shapes and not just form. And not just even just color, but visual order is incorporated right from the beginning. And that's what the fog gives you. That's what blurring your eyes gives you. 
So paint as if you're coming out of a fog. Now, here's a portrait, and this is these are demonstrations, uh, and I'm afraid this is, some of these things need some serious varnish, but um, this is a demonstration of the same thing, uh, where you can see what aspects of the portrait of the head have been dealt with and what other ones haven't. But you can see the strength of players like this. These are very articulate and very specific. And they, in a lay-in like this, that's actually your job, is to get these dead on. Get all the places where you see significant things that will hold that ground. You know, Sargent talks about points and angles. So you get down to this soft transition here and that piece right there, and you have something that you say, and I'm gonna put that a half inch from the bottom of the painting and live with it. So this becomes, in the category of a point, this thing up here in the turn, or even in that widow's peak, perhaps even in things like that, that lost area of the brow. Certainly in this lost area here, you're gonna see an orientation around spots. But again, if you blur your eye, if you don't blur your eye, you may see her lips, or you will insist on seeing her lips. If you blur your eye, you'll see the edge of the nose. You'll see the right side in this particular lighting, and it's gonna be different in every lighting you look at. And that's what I mean by visual order. I mean, sorry, by, well, both by visual order, but and specifically, if you blur your eye, you could set a figure in this very same light in your own studio if you have a single light source. And you can, am I showing this in decent light? I think I, maybe I'm not. Uh, but you can um, uh, set up a model in this light and see how much more detail there is. And you, what, what I'm actually doing is saving you an enormous amount of time in setting up your painting. Now, one of the reasons I do this, and maybe the primary one, is because the efficiencies. I found at one point in, in my lay-ins that it was, I was taking days and days, I mentioned this before, day, many days, and I wasn't even sure yet that it was going to be a good portrait. So I decided, uh, as, mon as among as many other things, I decided that I wanted to know right there on the first day, I wanted to have the canvas covered. I wanted to know for sure whether it was going to be a really good portrait. You know, I wanted to have the placement on the page. I wanted to have the color scheme. I wanted to have, and, and the way to avoid a bunch of extra work I found was to just draw the strong players that make up the arabesque. And the only way to do that is to blur your eyes and see who's first. And those things do all the work for you. There's everything else is suggested really nicely and really strongly. It's true there is a great a sense of form and that sort of thing. You can't paint a flat look. The look of nature wouldn't would include that. And even to some extent, obviously, it would include the busy parts, uh, you know, the fact of the busyness up there. But, you know, that's, um, that's the best I can do for right now. I'm going to get, leave it at that. And I'm going to suggest to you that I'm going to come back to this subject again. So, um, and um, so, but the question of ever doing drawings underneath, uh, preliminary drawings of any kind under, under the, you just don't do it because, you, you know, and I, what her question, what her point was, um, I'm assuming that preliminary compositional drawings have been made on complex subjects first. For example, in interior scenes, complex still life setups. And so the answer, of course, is they're not. We treat, as an impressionist, you treat the scene, the mise scene, the, 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 the slice of life in front of you. You treat it as its own ensemble. It's, a, it's considered a finished ensemble. You search for the poetry in it, but you do it on, in a very uh, disciplined fashion. Fashion. So when you set something up, you're not having to. You're not able. You're not allowed to do a bunch of preliminary drawing. You actually are required to listen to it and see what it wants to, what it, what its order is. You know, and you're searching for uh, uh, the order of things, color of things, value of things, size of things, uh, angle, gestural. You know, all those things. Every one of these players, they're all part of a visual package. Uh, the realist doesn't quite get that, and, and that's one of the reasons I encourage you to think outside that box, um, the noodling box, uh, where the old model was, literally draw the contours, uh, the drawing, you know, draw contours and then noodle up the inside and you've done your job. This guy, this is far more comprehensive, and I suggest to you that for a student, especially somebody really trying to learn how to paint, you need to be able to do this. Maybe I'll just leave it at that. So make your comments, make your... Um, um, likes, shares, and all those things. I appreciate it very much. I will get back to the subject. Um, and again, Louise, if you want me to ask again, ask, uh, express confusion, I, will, I would love to get back to this one. This is the heart and soul of this way of working, and uh, I'm giving it to you on a silver platter. Oh, <laughs> word to the wise. Good luck with uh, picking it up. All right.